Friends, one amazing series of YA novels. An insatiable thirst to relive the glory that is K.A. Applegate's literary masterpiece. This is Phantomorphs, the Dork Vegeta Chronicles. Hello and welcome to the Dork Bajir Chronicles, a podcast where we watch the entire Animorphs TV series one episode at a time and then talk about it once in a while. Today, we'll be talking about the Animorphs TV series, and by that I mean the entire thing, as this is our wrap-up episode. Pew, pew. We just watched the last episode of the series last week, so if you haven't heard that, or any of them, really, probably go listen to those first. My name is Mikhail, the host. I'm Tessa, the expert. And I'm Brayden. Uh, slugger of water. And we are joined for the last time, probably, by uh, TV expert Jared. If I have anything to say about it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of this episode, Jared's going to finally die and go to heaven. <laughs> oh, His reanimated corpse will fall back into the earth. This is this is actually our cats. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um. So this episode is going to be largely responses. It's it, I mean, we'll have some like wrap up thoughts, obviously, but it's going to be a lot of responses from questions that you guys, the listeners asked us. I've got quite a few lined up here, so we'll see how many we can get through. Uh, but the first thing we're going to do, which I think is probably the thing most people asked about, which was what's our favorite moment and what's our least favorite moment? Or what was the worst moment, I should say, of the show. Oh, also, uh, heads up, I'm going to be asking you guys, like, quiz questions. Ooh. Both about, not so much about the show, like, what was the name of the controller, blah, 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 but more about, like, the production and actors surrounding the show. There's nice. a couple trivia questions about this the show This is as well, like but. OG Phantomorphs Live from the Gardens callback trivia quiz. There's no points. There's no points. I can't Good, deal with that, that again. <laughs> unless, unless, the, unless the questions about the actors are, is like, <laughs> was Sean Ashmore Iceman? Yes, that's about the only ones that I have. I know. We're all gonna suck. Who's the handsomest? Me. Yo, nailed it. Oh. One point. Eugene Lipinski. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to start with their uh, we'll do favorite moments first, maybe? Well, uh, my favorite moment um, put in a vacuum the bit in My Name is Eric, where Axe is doing bigger and wilder activities inspired by watching TV. Oh, my uh, God. I just felt like that was just good comedy. Um, I thought that was just really, really just a good, interesting bit to see. Um, shame about the rest of the episode and the rest of the series. But there was there was something there. There was a. There was an an inherent quality to that that I think could have been very interesting. Um, as for worst moment, uh, all every everything about the effects they used to portray Andalites were absolute garbage, F tier as shit. Um, really, everything that they used to do spaceships, aliens, holograms, except the morphing was just really low quality so yeah i agree i can't agree more honestly with that last one the seeing the andalites as like the shitty puppets after them being built up so much by the art and the descriptions in the show in the books mm -hmm. fuck me fuck me all right my question what do you think was worse the andalites or the hork -Bajir? hork -Bajir were oh, worse hork but just worse. barely because the hork -Bajir didn't move at all they were just a gif I'd say the Andalites because um, the Hork Bajir, yeah, because they didn't move as much. They could still, uh, could they could it. still. There was a level of believability to it. I would also put the Andalites mostly just because we saw a lot more of the Andalites, and there were many instances where they could have made them a lot better, mm -hmm. but they just didn't. Just don't give them mullets. <laughs> Why do they all have... Why are yeah. they so hairy and furry? Actually, this is going to come up a lot in the audience questions. So let's save, let's save our hot takes on the puppets okay. <laughs> for that okay. section. Uh, I'll go next. Okay. If I'm talking, like, ironically, like, what's so bad, it's good. 
is just that one line where Axe is eating that chili, Marco's dad's chili. <laughs> and he's like, this is an excellent food. This is a wonderful food. Wonderful. Yeah, that fuck, was so fuck, good. His squeaky little voice. Uh, also, I really liked Visser 3, like, eyeballing that cracker for no reason. <laughs> like, at the yep. beginning of a scene. We remember, Mikhail, we did half an episode on cracker I facts. Know. I know. <laughs> There's a reason why. Uh, if, I, if I'm talking about what my actual favorite moment was, I think it was the, the scene where they... I think they're having an argument, and when Jake delivers his argument, he grabs a fry out of Marco's hand, and then when Marco offers a rebuttal, he grabs the fry out of Jake's hand. And the way it's directed is actually, like really well done like cuts to jake swings over to marco swings back to jake back to marco really good and it was like unheard of for everything else in this not only that episode but the whole series was nowhere nearly as good as that they did like a fun blur effect for like just they like they only focused on the the um the fry Fry. and everything else was out of focus and it was just like really fun and yeah that was definitely one of my favorite moments too good because no one's allowed to disagree with me. Worst moments. I have two worst moments. And I think the first one's actually probably a lot of people's worst moment is Fisher 3 and Axe have that fight as Andalites. Love and it. Yeah. Like, oh my God. Love this it. is not yeah. just bad. This is like ir- insultingly bad. There's not much more to say about that. If you guys haven't seen that episode, do go watch it because it is <laughs> It's bad. so bad. Uh, before I have two, another worst moment, but I want to preface that with a uh, first Quiz question. Ah, oh, boy, 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 boy. Yeah. Quiz time. Let's not do that every, every question. <laughs> <laughs> when asked about her favorite episode to film, Brooke Nevin, who plays Rachel, said, what? Or rather, just tell me the episode, maybe. And it doesn't have to be the name of the episode, just like what? Whatever the what. episode was where she was with Cassie and they had to make that huge jump across the the precipice and it was like a foot and a half. Yeah, that's also uh, that no was more also yeses my guess because that's correct. Is it actually? Uh, that was all. Oh, yeah, yeah, she said it was the Predator Part One and Two, which is that episode. Fuck uh, yeah. Her exact quote was, <laughs> "I got to do some really cool action stuff, jumping across large abysses." Oh my god! Oh, god. <laughs> oh hell yeah! <laughs> Good job, Lee. I win, Dork Bajir. Golf that was clap. also the one where they had Golf like clap. the fucking like samsung stereo receiver was the controls for the ship yep remember that the giant sound mixing board oh god that was so bad that was the episode where they went to space yep so that was why my worst moment who wants to go next i'll go next favorite moment the dance at the end was completely adorable the costuming is on point they look so cute i mentioned rachel's hair last week it's still true jake wearing Cassie's dead grandpa suit with a <laughs> scarf looking like a fucking ball. Axe's fro and the fact that he and Marco dance. Just great. Um, Jake eating slugs in front of Visser 3 and Tom. Also oh, great. Yeah, that was a big dick move. I like that. <laughs> that, <laughs> that was, was awesome. Um, a lot of Rachel's delivery actually was kind of favorite just because she's trying so hard and it's so earnest, but it's so bad. <laughs> like, it's played so earnestly, and it's just so terrible. Um, I also loved when they threw a skunk at Marco. <laughs> <laughs> just like, here, catch! I'll throw you a skunk. Um, worst moment. The Andalite mullets made me cry, for sure. The Drake Ooh. and Beam flashlights were rough. Like, it would have been way cooler for some kind of ray gun. That's what we were all hoping. Um, but Cassie... Time for another quiz question to interrupt. What did Christopher Ralph, who plays Tobias, think of the Andalite puppets? He probably thought they were very realistic. I'm going to stop everyone's answers because that's correct. <laughs> I just had to think of the worst answer. I was going to say I was going to say that, yeah, he probably was contractually obligated or at least felt very obligated to not talk shit about them. So we would probably <laughs> yeah. have said something along the lines of like, they looked very realistic or or like um, my guess was going to be, oh, man, the props guys worked so hard on those. They were so <laughs> proud of them. Some like fact about them without stating the quality within his mind. It's actually a bit of a backhanded comment. So he says they look very lifelike. 
it's better when they are actually there instead of when you add special effects later, <laughs> which is sort of a saving, like saving the show because everyone well, thought they looked bad. And so it's like, well, it was the post guys that fucked. <laughs> I, I honestly thought it was going to be something more to be like, they did the best with what they had kind of thing. <coughs> I'm proud yeah, of what they even. did. Hey, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I have to say, my very worst moment, though, was when Cassie sneaks under a toilet stall and you hear her go burp, and then she runs back out and she's like, okay, I burped the croc. Like, in the book, uh, Rachel is burping the croc. The croc is coming out of her back like some alien being birthed from her flesh while she's turning into a grizzly. And when I would read the book as a kid, like, I had it directed in my head. It looked so cool. And then the show yeah. just did. I mean, there's no way this show could have made that scene look like how I wanted it to. But damn, yeah. I have an idea of how it looks in my head, and it looks dope. Yeah, I'm just picturing a whole yeah. fuck ton of body horror. Yep. Oh yeah. What was uh, your favorite moment, Jared? Oh, Axe's leather jacket. Uh, mm-hmm. Eugene Lipinski getting insanely angry at everybody. I always loved that. He was so angry all the time. Um. Thinking back, I really enjoyed the episode where uh, Jake got yerked and be- kind of just became a dick. <laughs> yeah, he was acting like Ooh. a dick as a yerk. <laughs> Quiz question interruption. <laughs> when she, what did Sean Ashmore say when it when asked if he thought the yerks or something like the yerks could be real? I don't know, man. It's hard to <laughs> say. Ask me more questions about X-Men. And then he went on. <laughs> <laughs> he responded, and I quote, uh, like... Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. What was your worst moment? Jane? Oh Christ! There was a lot of worst moments. Um, the CGI, like the the actual morphing, will haunt me yeah. until my dying breath. Yeah, it's rough stuff. Mind but... you, I think it was pretty cool at the time. Mm. Probably the coolest part of the whole show at the time. Yeah, that's really sad too. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> I really hated how they. Just how they did any adult character. It's they were so over the toply dickish, even when they were yeah. like not controllers. I'm like I'm thinking the um the science teacher who uh catches uh, uh Tom and tries to de yerkify him. You think he was a dick, really? He's like he was pretty nice eh. to, to Jake. Eh. Uh yeah. <laughs> and there's that it's um uh I really, and just the tone of the show being, they, they never quite dedicated to, from what I know of the Animorphs books from this podcast and you guys, how like, it's dark as fuck, but they were never quite ready to just go balls deep and go dark. They were just like, this is a children's show. Um, I will say I did like when they took episodes and focused more on an individual character. Like an episode that was entirely Tobias based or entirely Marco based or entirely Jake based or entirely Cassie based, entirely Rachel based, blah, blah, blah. Those were like a lot more enjoyable, I found, than the ensemble ones. I don't know if that comes down to the writing and directing or if that comes down to their chemistry as an ensemble. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I I, I buy that. Mostly Axe's leather jacket. That was mostly my favorite. (laughs) It fit him so well, and, and there him, was a 20 in the pocket. And, What's him not sho- and him shoving fucking ice cream up his foot. <laughs> that was what the worst, idiot. because it was like, not only did it not like play as funny as it could have been, it only made sense if you read the books. And so if you didn't read yeah. the books, you're just fucked. <laughs> and also, X, it, you're still stupid because you're wearing a shoe. How can you eat through a shoe, you idiot? <laughs> <laughs> so maybe like part. humans have figured out space travel maybe he just thought like oh well they must have figured out a way to open their feet to eat <laughs> gross <laughs> oh. also it's not like he didn't see other humans eating he was literally standing like behind someone eating. <laughs> yeah um okay let's move on to our OTP Let's say like, alert. yeah, we're going to do like a overall OTP alert. OTP alert. Can I, speaking, since we're already there, Axe and like so many unnamed women in this show were flirting hardcore with him. The ice cream lady That's gave true. him free ice cream. There was that lady in Siberia who was like with spring rolls who loved him. It's that fucking hair, baby. He's got that <laughs> yeah. fro that oh, the that girls fro. want. The magic fro, baby. 
Uh, should we just go through the list? So should we start with Jake and Cassie? I could not care less about this relationship. <laughs> I felt like it wasn't like the under the hood kind of like mature relationship it is in the books. It's more of like a... Not only mature, but mature ring. Yeah, tr- exactly. It changes, right? In this one, it was just like, it's implied that they're boyfriend and girlfriend, but... But we literally only Never see, see that, that yeah. one time at the very end. And they still only say it's just friends at the very end. It's very, yeah, it's not built up at all. Rachel Tobias at least had some stuff. They stood on the lawn of Rachel's house and Rachel's sister took a picture of them. Like, that's fucking great. That's true. I mean, not that it was great, but the that Rachel happened. and Tobias one was like. <laughs> borderline creepy how hard those two wanted each other <laughs> yeah the t- like where tobias was like watching her from the bushes but then later she like walks up to him okay <laughs> this is something i didn't talk about last week but i should have uh at the dance at the end there's a part where like rachel and tobias are slow dancing and they're standing really close to each other i mean as you would if you were you know 17 at a dance or whatever but if you look at Brooke Nevin's face, and I recommend everyone go and look at this one scene, she is so wildly uncomfortable with the yeah. whole thing. I mean, she's young, like as an actress, she was 16 or 17 or something. And the others were all like 19 and plus. So I could see it's a little weird, right? But you could see as like they say lines or like she responds to things that Tobias says, she's like, can't take it seriously because she's so nervous. I'm assuming yeah. I'm not here, but <laughs> I dig that vibe. That's super fucking weird, considering how like she delivered the rest of the lines throughout the rest of the goddamn series. Well, because those were just lines, versus this is like actually standing in proximity with somebody. But I think there yeah. was a bit of a moment of comfort. Like he rests his mouth on her forehead, and they're kind of cuddling while they dance there. Oh, I'm not saying they're not, like, close. I'm just saying the scenes where Christopher Ralph is basically, like, breathing on her face. Yeah, that was so rough. Close. Yeah, I've also heard that, like, not every actor is, like, self-conscious about their breath smell. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like when you're doing scenes like that, in my opinion, I'm not an actor, but I would assume, if it was me anyways, there's no fucking way I wouldn't brush my teeth or, like, at least have, like, mints before. Right? You know? Like, all the time. All the time. But what if your breath just smelled like shit, and you had to, like, basically talk into someone's mouth? Should we, for the sake of pleasing everyone who's going to yell at me if I don't do it, the Marco Axe OTP? Marco Axe OTP! It's... The dance at the end was the only real, like, anything we see for that, but it's pretty good. They have some couple cute like uh relationship moments like when marco is touching the andalite toilet and axe is like yeah it's a toilet (laughs) and marco's like damn this is awakening things in me (laughs) i like feces porn now (laughs) Um, alien feces porn does anyone have anything to say about it before we move on other than the fact that it existed in the show it it definitely existed in the show and that is where i will leave it it was there. Um, Jake Marco friendship, OTP, stealing that French fry back it's and not, forth. That's not an OTP, though. Uh, friendship be, is not an OTP. There can be friendship OTPs. Come on. Come on. Also, also when uh, when they end up linking arms to look at that Yeah, uh, that they picture. do. They link arms. You know what? I think the entirety of the... Um, I think the entirety of the Animorphs crew are actually just a polycule. Ooh, hot. I don't know what that is, but that's a what you I call agree. polyamorous relationship. Do you guys want to talk about the Tom and Melissa Chapman OTP? Uh, he's so old, though. Uh, it's not really an OTP. It was just like the only other relationship we actually saw on the show. Wait a minute. Who the fuck's Melissa Chapman? That's uh, the one that Rachel's he hits friend? on. He was like 13. Oh, gross. Yeah. yeah ah, I pushed that news. out of my mind. Damn it. Yeah. Yeah, it just happens the one time and it's awful. Oh, wait, there's an OTP kind of like a hate OTP between Visser 1 and Visser 3 in the in the oh, garden. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> in I'd the pay to watch that. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty fucked, the whole thing. That'd be that'd be some serious hate fucking and it'd be great. Mm. <laughs> squish, squish, <laughs> squish. Before we get to our fan questions, should we do our very last TV series, Visa 3, 
Morph Minute. This is a Morph Minute. This is a Morph Minute. Three, three, three. Before we jump into our best and worst Fisher 3 moments, I have a quiz question. <gasps> Uh-oh. This is actually a five-parter. Uh-oh. So, okay. okay. Fuck. Uh, you guys have to tell me if this is a Visser 3 quote or a Hitler oh quote. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Hi, my name is Adolf Hitler. <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's go around the table. So we'll go, we'll go Tessa guess one, then Brayden, then Jerry. Okay. okay. First one. Uh, this world will soon be ours. That's Visser 3. Uh, correct. Ding, ding. B, we shall only talk of peace when we have won the war. Uh, that is Hitler. Correct. C, Jared, the most glorious victory of all time. Oh, shit. Uh, mm. I'm going to go with Hitler. Yeah, it was Oh, actually. shit. I was guessing. I don't, was y'all are doing a great job. I don't job. remember the term glorious being used in the show. <laughs> the man's wealth and power makes him a useful tool. Oh, uh, that's Visser 3. A hundo. This is a bit of a giveaway for Brayden. If you don't like me when I'm angry, you're going to hate me when I'm bored. <laughs> Oh gosh. Hmm. 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 Eric Bana is the Hulk. <laughs> I mean, that's got to be Visor Three. It was Visor Three. Yeah, <laughs> it's when he was threatening Chapman in that episode where we first meet Victor. Trent. I remember this one. Yeah. Yep. That's such a good line. Okay, so you guys got a hundred percent of them. Woo! So clearly, they're not as similar as I thought. <laughs> clearly, we all either know far too much about Hitler or far too much about Visor Three. <laughs> it's probably the latter. <laughs> it's, it's just you can tell, like the you're gonna hate me when I'm bored. Like I remember how Eugene Lipinski's beautiful face looked as he spat that line onto Chapman's snithering little mouth. Ugh. Also, like controversial, Hitler was actually a pretty good public speaker. But anyways, I mean that's not controversial as long as you're not like <laughs> saying it as a virtue, like saying. Saying any given like Nazi soldier was a sharpshooter is fine, but saying that is some sort of like some sort of, like saying Hitler was a good public speaker is fine. But if you say that in the context of and that justifies at least a little bit of his horrible, <laughs> horrible yeah. life, yada yada, that's too far. <laughs> yeah, that's too much. You know, you're right. <laughs> And I'm glad you made that distinction, because I'm going to talk about Hitler for a lot of this episode. <laughs> <laughs> um, what are your guys' best and worst Mr. Three moments? When he morphs just the eyes. <laughs> yeah, that, that was, actually was really like, fucked really up. fucked. Was he looking at, like, a bug, I think? I think he was looking at, like, an Andalite trapped in morph, and just morphed just the eyes, and like, <laughs> oh, it was the cat. It was Rachel as the cat, I think. He also, like, morphed looking into a, do- a-, a cat's cage. He morphed like just the Andalite head right. for a second. Is that the one you're? Is that the time you're thinking of? I think so. He started with the eyes. He though. morphs all the way into the Andalite. It does start with the eyes, but he does morph his whole head. It's pretty yeah, awful. Yeah, it's rough. What about the part where he? Uh, remember when he's talking to Visser One on the hologram? Yeah, and he's like slowly crushing this pop can. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that. That's that was good. mine. That was mine. Pop can. Yeah. Oh fuck, that's funny. We mentioned these ones already, but the I mean, crackers... It probably happened several times, but I specifically remember at one point the Animorphs all escape, and he just goes, And I... Yeah. <laughs> and he yeah. just snarls, and he looks like every bad guy from every kid's show ever. Yeah. Yeah. It, sound, it was like a Star Trek, original Star Trek series, like... The way it was filmed and delivered and everything. It was awful. Except he was not nearly as good as Khan. <laughs> we mentioned these Sorry, ones already, Eugene. but like the crackers <laughs> and the slap fight with Axe were uh, pretty primo. Well, the crackers are in the top tier, Mr. Three Moments. The slap fight's got to be like the, <laughs> the lowest, lowest shit tier moments. The way it was directed was like fucking terrible. Not to mention, like, everything else about it, the way yeah. it's edited, the writing, the fact that it exists at all. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, we've covered a lot of Eugene Lipinski's uh, adventures in our uh, TV show episodes. Maybe we should move on to some fan questions. First question comes from the ubiquitous at movie polls on Twitter. Do you guys think it's possible to have a live-action Animorph series done right? I 
totally think you could. But it depends highly on the budget. Because in the 90s, you could do like, I remember a story specifically about who directed Alien? Ridley Scott? Yeah. Yeah. Ridley Scott talking about how like originally the first Alien movie was supposed to be a monster like slasher movie. But because of the budget and like the restrictions on VFX and stuff like that, then it would just look, it looked like shit, basically. Uh, So he turned it into a horror movie where you really don't see a lot of the alien yeah. ever. And it like it's actually really good. And other than a couple scenes, it holds up really good over the years. This show could definitely take some lessons from that because less is more, especially when you don't have a budget, yeah. is 100% true. If you have money, you can turn something like this, even as a TV show, into something pretty epic. Like Game of Thrones kind of proved that, where with the right money you can make something so surreal and so beyond reality into something really good. It just costs. Like, I've got to imagine that the entire run of Game of Thrones costs way more than any single movie has ever cost to make. Oh, for sure. Like, they were they were getting up to movie budgets for the last couple of episodes of the series. Exactly, in the millions. So, is it possible to make a live-action anywhere series? Yes. I just not like this. I feel like there would be no way, like, I feel like a live action series will always look worse than if they just did it animated. Like, they would just be able to make it cooler. They'll be able to make the alien designs cooler. They'll be able to make the morphing cooler. Yeah, that's how I, that's how I'm thinking. I mean, like, the question is not, what's a better medium? It's just, could you do it properly? And if your answer is no, that's totally fine also. Like, even just like the CGI animals, like, because they wouldn't have the budget to get live animals on the show that often so they would cgi them yeah. and the cgi animals would probably just look like the live action lion king animals like they would just look uh mm-hmm. weird and they yeah. wouldn't have any genitals and it's like what's the point <laughs> <laughs> what's the point gotta love that lizard pee <laughs> uh brayden what do you think um i had a lot of the same thoughts as both of you i definitely think it probably wasn't possible to do animorphs in the 90s they did Maybe the best they could. Honestly, it doesn't matter. Um, But like CGI has definitely gotten cheaper and better and easier to make over the years. And I think you it certainly wouldn't take Game of Thrones money to do an Animorphs TV show. And I think uh, it might even be able be easier to pull off than Game of Thrones because it's very it's already very episodic content. Yeah, that's kind of the bonus of this one is that the books are like such easy reference yes. and we're very up until like maybe where we're at in the book series right now we're very like one and done kind of thing like this the same as the end of the at the end of the book as it is at the beginning of the book kind of thing which translates very easily into tv yeah jared what do you think i honestly don't think you could not because of any like constraints in the technology or uh, anything along those lines, but in the sense that, like, <laughs> how would you possibly get the tone of this show right without it just being f- fucking, like, pure destruction porn kind of thing? Literally just watching children, like, <laughs> maim themselves and goddamn die. I think it's it's just... Yeah, I don't know. It's a good question, because it's like... I'm trying to take the question as literally as possible and, like, divorce myself from the show, because... Could you make a live-action Animorph series done right? Yes. Could you make a live-action Animorph series done right with the same demographic? Fucking no. Because the books were already too old for the demographic they were selling to to begin with, right? My my thing is, think, could, you, could you make it? Yes. Would it be good? Not necessarily. Yeah. Which is a good non-committal, no, not a real answer, but... Looks good on looks good on on paper. Yeah. <laughs> if you want good animals content, read the fucking books. I, yeah, that's the other problem. Is like also getting people to read books is not as easy as just saying read a book. But I feel you. It is when I tell them to. Uh. Okay. Next question comes from at Esnewin on Twitter again. How much would you have to be paid to rewatch the TV series? Oh, I would pay maybe. I think it added up to about $30, which is what I paid because I couldn't handle watching it on YouTube with the like, it's already standard definition and it's like original form. It was like really degraded into like 144p 
on YouTube. Mm -hmm. So I, I bought a lot of it on um, just like different streaming sites that were having it on sale and stuff. Yeah, it's <laughs> like... I, I, I did kind of did that near the end of the series, too, because I was just sick of watching the YouTube rips that, uh, like you said, 144p, but, like, covered in Vaseline. Well, and it was also mm -hmm. hard to find. Yeah, yeah they're hard um, to find. A lot of the episodes later on in the season. And let's face it, they're not good. So <laughs> it would have to be an exorbitant amount of money. Yeah, totally. Brandon? My answer would just be entirely determined by, like, how long is it? I wouldn't take a lump sum. I would just calculate, like... $18 by however many hours it is, throw in a lunch break somewhere, call it labor, take, yeah, 18 bucks an hour. $18? Yeah. Wow. You don't value your time as much as I do. <laughs> Although $18 with, <laughs> that's a lot of money, actually. I would take more if, like, they wanted me to do something like this again, where, like, I was commenting on it and, like, yeah, I, sure. I, 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 I yeah, talk yeah. about it a bit more. Uh, that it's eighteen dollars an hour, but it's nineteen ninety nine dollars. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and you can invest in Apple and Bitcoin right before they get big. Before we hit our next fan question, I have a quiz question. <gasps> quiz, quiz, <laughs> quiz, 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 quiz. Of the six main cast members, who has read most of the Animorphs or the most of the Animorphs series? So this is based on interviews. So obviously, I, I mean, like at the time, not today. Sean Ashmore, for whoever sure. played Cassie. Okay. Brandon, what's your guess? I th I feel like Sean Ashmore, maybe. <laughs> it was actually Brooke Nevin. Oh, man, that was no! my second guess. Yeah. Everyone looked to her for, like, uh, reference and stuff like that. She hadn't read all the series, according to interviews, but uh, she had definitely read the most out of any of the cast members. <sighs> Our next fan question comes from at the Kingle Mingle on Twitter. This is kind of a tie-in to the um, live-action thing, but was there anything good from the original TV show you would keep if you were making a modern adaptation? Now, that doesn't mean scenes necessarily. Like, the modern adaptation could be animated or CGI or however you want to do it. Uh, I personally think I would keep Sean Ashmore because his voice is, like, ageless and he can play, like, 16 even today, it seems like. Also, I think the one thing that they, like, did not capitalize properly on in the books was Visser 3 interacting with humans that aren't controllers. Yeah. Or like with controllers as a human. Because they kind of did that a lot in this show for like probably just budget reasons, honestly. Which worked out in their favor because the puppet was terrible for the Visser 3 Andalite. But I would have liked I would like to see more of that if they did do another frankly more books or more TV shows. Brandon? My answer is I would keep uh, we've made fun of it a lot. I've made fun of it a lot personally, but like, I think, I think that actually the flashlights as Dracon beams is actually an interesting piece of world building, a sort of a way to like have plausible deniability, um, have plausible deniability when it comes to carrying around a deadly alien weapon. If it looks like just a odd flashlight and you're like wielding it around, then people are just like, Oh, that guy's just weird and has a flashlight. I thought that was an interesting piece of world building that it took me a while to pick up on, or maybe that just the designers just got lucky uh, when they had a very low budget, but I thought it was uh, cool. It is an interesting little bit. Yeah. I think later on when someone was like, I don't know if it was Brayden or if it was a fan or something. But so, someone said, like, well, that way they could just carry them in the open. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, it's like, that's actually really smart. <laughs> that's a really good point, actually. Uh, yeah, I think that Tobias getting his human form way back, way earlier, uh, would work just logistics wise. Um, and again, if if we're doing a live action adaptation, having Axe crash land in the woods versus underwater, under the ocean way easier uh, to film and still makes a lot of sense about why he would be so lost because of like depending on where you are in the world there could be radio quiet zones and stuff and i doubt thought speak works super great in those areas either mm -hmm. wait did he land in the ocean in the books yeah in the books he's like underneath the ocean super deep they have to morph dolphins jesus yeah all right he almost drowns to death like the whole the yurks blast the the ship open so it just crumples and destroys Christ. yeah yeah 
It's fucked up. And then Visser 3 morphs uh, this large mound that's just covered in a, ti- a ton of tiny little tongues that just like flap against the water and slowly make him swim. <laughs> It's undetermined what he does as an attack, but he can just swim like that. <laughs> He's just gross. That's his attack. Yeah, it's nasty. Um, keep wise. I, I'm with you, Michaela. I would definitely keep Sean Ashmore. Um, eh, eh. I honestly don't know. Like, I don't. This one's a little tougher for me because I don't know the. I don't know a ton of the changes they made to the show from the books to kind of go from there. But um, yeah. But still, anything you liked that you think would have been nice if they had done everything else, right? Uh, I I keep Sean Ashmore, and honestly, I'd probably leave it at that. Yeah, man. He was the best part of the whole show. Absolutely. Yeah. Eugene Lipinski was a close second, yeah. Uh, next question comes from at the Slan on Twitter. A lot of Twitter questions. If you could have any director slide in to guest direct one scene in the series, which director would it be? Which scene? I think... The scenes where they're arguing. So, like, remember it was like boy versus girl in that one episode. Yeah, about uh, the dance. Or TV or Axe was watching too much TV and stuff. Yeah. Oh yeah. That Anything one. Anything where they're like not fighting aliens or like talking about fighting aliens. I think Judd Apatow would do an amazing job with that stuff. Mm, he might cast it differently, but you know. I got this question locked and loaded, but everybody else go first. I would say I want Edgar Wright to direct like a really campy one. Like the like the toilet episode or um, like but make it a whole episode where they have to try and break into zone 91 and then it's just a toilet like just some fucking fun campy shit. He would I think it would just be so, so hilarious. I would love to see Cronenberg get to direct uh, our now famous tail fight. Uh, because I think that the body horror that could arise oh, from fucking um, horrifying. Yeah, from like two living weapons traveling faster than the eye can see with an utter lack of care for however many wounds they get because they can just morph them away is just so up Cronenberg's alley. That's a really good point that they never talk about, which is like, what would somebody behave like if they knew that they couldn't get they couldn't die from a wound? Yeah. Ooh. That's another question. That's pretty <laughs> trippy. That's pretty trippy. <laughs> All right, Jared, hit me, hit me with your locked in answer. Guillermo del Toro, because he would make <laughs> everything so sexy, and it and would he would so have creepy. it would be so creepy, but it would still have that like fantastical sense of kind of wonder that he somehow manages to channel into everything. Maybe it's because he legitimately believes that fairies exist, but. Yeah, Guillermo del Toro, not even a question. I I thought that's what you were saying. You got so excited about it. I was like, oh, it's probably our boy G. Uh, Before I ask our next question, I got some quiz questions. What did Boris Cabrera, the actor who plays Marco, say when asked what he thought of the Animorphs books? Oh, you know, they're pretty good. (laughs) There are books? (laughs) I don't read books, though. I mainly just, like, think swole. about how I can't wait until Instagram is invented. <laughs> uh, I think Alberto uh, replied, uh, never read him. Boris Cabrera. Boris. Good try, though. <laughs> uh, he says, I think the books are pretty cool because we morph into something real. Dot, dot, dot. Unlike the Power Rangers. Uh, which was a weird call out uh, for Power Rangers, Especially but. since you have zero ground to stand on here. Oh, <laughs> no. Is Cabrero like a seventh day like evangelist? Does he not think dinosaurs exist? <laughs> oh, I think it's because they were robot uh, dinosaurs. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Whatever. It's, a, it's, <laughs> it's an old interview. Uh, next question comes from Cheese Chinese Gambino on Instagram. How do you think we can get some real steam going behind a proper Animorph series? Uh, I'm sure no one wants to see it condensed into movies. Uh, could we get one of the biggies like Netflix or Amazon Prime involved? I, this is a tough thing to answer because it's like the question is, how do you think we can get some real steam going? The answer is you can't. Because Hollywood is a grinding, destructive machine that an individual can't affect unless you're an executive already. However, if you want to influence market research, you can do what a lot of people are doing already, including us, which is 
create critical thinking about the show and and don't stop doing it because this stuff if when people go online to see like hey i wonder what like property can get re- renewed if it's not already in the works they're not looking for people saying like make an animorphs movie and that's your whole twitter account is just make an animorphs movie they're looking for people who are like genuinely thinking deeply about the properties or at the very least creating things around it like fan fiction and fan art and things like that uh as much as people think it was dumb to make a power rangers movie that fandom is like pretty buck wild and still going pretty strong overall. So it made sense from a market research point of view. Whatever. That's the quality of that movie is a different subject. But my answer to this was just like do more stuff like not literally like what we're doing, but like with the spirit of what we're doing is critical critical thinking, critical creation around the property. I think a great way to show enthusiasm while keeping a distance is to show your appreciation for <laughs> Animorphs themed podcasts in particular. <laughs> Your Patreon donations nice. do not ensure that a movie of the series will occur. Your donations are still very much appreciated. Visit patreon.com slash Dorkpajer for more details. Wow, that was a really good delivery. It was. Thank you. I'm Crushed actually it. very proud of myself. <laughs> I almost it. started laughing halfway through, but that's immediately what I thought of when I saw how you guys set that up. And I'm like, this is perfect. But yeah, I think you're both very right. Just keep doing what we're doing. And if, uh, if, if Jared's uh soul has finally done his business on earth and he can die at the end of this episode and go to heaven he can talk to god for us and uh have god change the world but i won't (laughs) (laughs) do you have an answer for that Uh, it's it's pretty much the same thing you guys are saying the more you are involved the more you show uh your genuine love for this community and this property uh, as opposed to like, just I want a thing. Please make a thing. Make this. Mm-hmm. Do it now. Release if you're the like, Snyder cut. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Don't be a fucking release the Snyder cut, dude, and just yell it into the void. Make your own. Be the Snyder cut you want to <laughs> see in the world. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly what you guys are saying. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, next question comes from Zero Emoji. Z- Zero Emoji. Yeah, on Instagram. On a scale of 2009 vlog to amateur porn, how would you rate the cinematography of the series? Um, who wants to go first? <laughs> I just don't understand where that, like, how that scale works out, but, um... I think that's the joke. Uh, yeah, I think I I would uh, rate it as, like, sort of that sort uh very theatrical shooting like somebody who shoots like a theater play and can only oh, get yeah. very stuck, very certain angles. Um, mm-hmm. Technically competent, but like obviously not using the full space. I give it a C. Okay. I'd say it's like a 2014 vlog by someone trying to get YouTube famous. Like a lot of earnestness, but they're one of the first ones who are like, oh, wait, you can get famous from this. So there's no like makeup or good cameras or good lighting. They just know that fame is achievable through this format. So they're trying and they're hungry <laughs> for it. I rate this uh, on that scale. It rates a ho- that whole movie where my sister sat on my head when I was like one. <laughs> um, Jared, you got something snappy for us? The The weird vacation video that my grandparents made me watch about a vacation that I wasn't on. <laughs> nice. It's <Cool>. that. <laughs> was it like so. a vacation you weren't even invited to? Yeah. Oh my god. And everyone else was Great. like... <laughs> it was like them and my, my cousins weird. and my aunt and uncle in Hawaii and it was a thing. And I was like, well, that would have been fucking great, wouldn't it? <laughs> Why'd you invite us, you bastards? Um, next question. This is a quiz question. Uh, what happened when Sean Ashmore acquired the tiger on the show? What happened on set? I think the tiger let out a huge fart. I think it, it when he got close to it, it roared and Sean peed himself. <laughs> <laughs> so Sean, when he reached out to put his hand on the tiger's like muzzle, kind of, uh, his fingers went up the tiger's nose. Oh my oh god. god. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all the cast members talked about this in interviews of how terrifying it was. And apparently, he, like when he talks about it, he's like, the one thing that was the hardest to do was pulling them out slowly because the trainer on set had said, like, don't do anything quickly around the tiger because that's actually like a big trigger for tigers is like movement. 
Yeah. So he had to like really slowly remove his snotty tiger fingers. And the fact that the tiger didn't just rip his throat out for shoving his fingers up his nose. I mean, kudos to the tiger. Like, really? Yeah. <laughs> Christ. That is like the most, like, how bad can you pet a tiger that you accidentally put your fingers up its nose? Like, what? It's not like it's a gorilla. Its he nose was nervous. He probably big. wasn't. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't have been looking. Because, I mean, he's also acting, right? So he needs to look at where he's supposed to look. So it's possible he just didn't look in the right spot. Uh, our next question comes from Jacob Jones on Facebook. If you could do a third season to wrap up the story, how would you write it? Oh, Christ. Uh, well, as the one who knows the least about the quote unquote actual ending, um, what I would do is I would start off with them being like found out and they have to go underground with this uh, former controller resistance. And they, they so strip the budget, have a lot of outdoor shoots and be able to put a lot of money into fights, into effects, into prosthetics, stuff like that. OK, that's a that's a good answer. And because it's hard to know the story from the books also without reading it. I, I mean, OK, I'm not going to say anything about the actual ending. And so nobody like blast me for this because Brain hasn't read it and I want to spoil it. But the last arc would have been pretty awesome to do but we're sort of talking about like an ideal world here like if we're talking the same quality i don't want to ever see the final arc in that quality (laughs) because it would just ruin it for me uh if it wasn't for the final arc though i'd like to see some of the more crazy like megamorph stuff so like where they fight the vendor and stuff in the arctic from the books yeah that wasn't that wasn't megamorphs that was just a regular it was just a regular book yeah. yeah, so stuff like that where it was just like capery and not really like something mm-hmm. that had to have continuity to it. I want to see more of that stuff. I think it works better as a weekly and less as a co- uh, continuous thing, especially because the fucking release like schedule was terrible for this show. Yeah, I think the um, I would have had Tobias tell the Animorphs about the hot group movement and then have them work together to kind of embarrass the Yerks. We're going to find out that there is like a council of 13, like some big bosses above Visser 1 even, going to embarrass Visser 1 and Visser 3 in front of their bosses so bad that they're just like, okay, everybody wrap up and all of the Yerks go back home. But before they leave, Visser 1 mind wipes all of the humans. So they all go back to regular life, and it's just like a Shazam scientist logic of a group hallucination. Okay. As the person, as the person least versed in writing and really anything creative in this group, I'm going to go ahead and take a mulligan on this one. That's fine. I wouldn't expect you to really know what it could do afterwards. Also, not knowing the story. No, not even a clue. Our next question comes from James Jared Morrow on Facebook, who says. Which actors from the Animorphs TV show would you invite to your Sensate style mental orgy? Now, for anyone who hasn't seen Sensate, it's a story of eight people spread out across the world, like very much across the world, but they all have this like weird connection where they can tap into each other's skills, but also they also feel each other's like strong emotions. And because it's like orgasms, by the, it's yeah, it's filmed by the Wachowskis and written by them, so. There's a lot of sex and there's orgies where like they can all feel what all of them are feeling, even though none of them are in the same room. Uh, I would like to set a blanket rule of the adult versions of these actors, please. So, yeah, we can get into yeah. some dicey territory. Yeah, here. no, they're yeah. adults. So blanket rule, everyone's let's say 20 plus just to make it less gross. I would take all the main cast except for Axe and Marco. The reason is, okay, so I'm interpreting this more as like the characters, because I don't know enough about the people themselves. <laughs> Marco, it's just, I feel like he would just too, be too pervy. Where like everyone's like having a good time and it's like short busting it, where you're like, fucking no judgment. Marco's like judging and also <laughs> making deposits into the old spank bank way too often. Whereas Axe would just be like, um, what is happening? Why is this happening? I have a hard penis. <laughs> <laughs> and why? Okay, <laughs> yeah, I quit. That'll kill the mood like instantly. <laughs> Brayden? Um, 
I am keeping it simple. Uh, I would have all of them except the actor for Axe because his puppeteer is going to be there instead because he <laughs> will be an Andalite form. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas I would say, like, if you don't get with any, if with everyone, then do you even have bragging rights? Like, nobody wants to hear about how you got with, like, four sixths of uh, the Anamorphs, right? <laughs> I also, think, <laughs> also I it think says it, actors and not the characters. So, like, you could just do the actors and it would be fine. But would it, though? Sean Ashmore yeah. seems nice, but the others, I don't know enough about them. Boris Cabrera is, like, too ripped. Nadia Lee is, like, too corporate. <laughs> You're not in the same room with them, right? Like, it's a sensate mental orgy. Yeah, You're just you're right. feeling what they feel. You know that all of the Animorphs use that to get laid. Sean Asmore's like, hi, you might know me from Iceman, but also I was Jake and the Animorphs and all of these people <laughs> who were like, oh, my God. Yay. Hey, I'm Sean. I was Jake and the Animorphs. That's his Tinder profile. <laughs> Since I am a person of class, I know that it does require six people to have an orgy. So all of them hey, are at least five. Brayden and I are the only ones who are correct. <laughs> because uh Mikhail is one uh, uh, uh. Mikhail's one six. under. Yeah, but including Brayden makes six. All right. Next question is a quiz question. How did the hawk that played Tobias behave on set? Poorly. It was an animal. Wonderfully, because it uh freaking uh what is it? Falconry is a total thing. So uh I believe it was Brooke Nevin who said the hawk was a real professional. Oh, <laughs> she Cute. did the most scenes with the hawk ob for obvious yeah, reasons, obviously. right? So, yeah, all those gross sex scenes. Our next real question, or I guess fan question, comes from at the King of Mingle on Twitter again. Do you feel the crappiness of the show was inevitable given the constraints of the time, the 90s, or would it have actually been possible to affordably make a good TV show in the 90s? So, we kind of answered this a little bit already. I think the biggest difference is like, Given the budget for the show and the limitations on technology, is it possible that it could have been good? Hell no. <laughs> I feel like if they really changed the tone and lead more into the spy version of it, like if it was like instead of campy, oh, there's animals, they were like, okay, we are actually actively spying and it was played straighter, then it would be cool. I, I don't think the show had like anything right going for it at the time in the sense that the technology wasn't there. The budget wasn't there. Um, the time constraints weren't there since they did have to do this when they were all still, you know, roughly the same age. It, it's, I don't think it, there was no way the show could have turned out like decent. <laughs> I don't think. Okay. I, I think that's fair. And I think as I was thinking of the answer to this, it was like, Huh, I'm really stretching my assumptions of like what is possible to make this work when the real answer is yes, it was inevitable that it was shitty. It was way, yeah, way too it was ambitious. Inevitable. It was definitely like a Ninja Turtles moment where it was like, let's just market, market branding, market branding, market branding. Let's fuck the story, fuck the actual canon, fuck everything. Just make money on this property. And it kind of really shows. And I think it backfired in a way that the Ninja Turtle stuff didn't because the Ninja Turtle stuff kept happening and sort of made up for the shittiness of certain things. This thing, like a lot of the people who watched it were also reading the books and like fucking hated it. Even at the, in the interviews in the nineties, it was like, yeah, we realize fans of the books don't have as much to take away from this as <laughs> fans or people who haven't read it. Was like, so what you're saying is the fans hate it and no one else knows any better to say it's bad yeah, or good. Yeah, no one yeah. knows anything. Brayden? One thing that you learn pretty quick in film school when they start letting you like get your hands on a camera and write scripts and make an entire project with just the students is... No matter how hard you work, no matter how well you do on that particular shoot, every day is going to be someone's someone's worst day. Every project is going to be made a little bit harder, a little bit lesser by someone screw up, by someone going a little slower, by someone having a little less passion that day. But good stuff still comes out of film. 
um, no matter how bad anyone does at an individual project. So, n- no, no, I don't think it was ever inevitable because inevitable because there just isn't such a thing in film as not enough creativity. There's always going to be a way to write yourself out to to film yourself out to add more to take more from the project no matter how low your budget no matter how shoe stringy you're working on um there's always going to be a way out so no inevitable is not the word i would use okay uh-huh. I, I, that's very generous i think but also a better blanket rule probably than anything we said yeah uh, absolutely <laughs> yeah our next question comes from reagan mc McEnroe, I think I'm saying that right, on Facebook, uh, was watching the show more or less humane. <laughs> I'm reading that wrong. Was watching the sh- show more or less humane than waterboarding? Should the U.S. government employ animal spin watches as torture techniques in Guantanamo Bay? I'm going to answer the second question first and say I okay. don't think so, because then that will just be like letting more of the Yerks know who the Animorphs are. So don't do that. They're going to learn more of our secrets. I thought it was going to be, you're bringing prisoners from Guantanamo into the fan community. (laughs) I mean, yeah, but then there's that. (laughs) I feel like once you do it to a few people, it can be used as like a threat where it's like, sure, we could string you up by your arms, keep the lights like flashing strobe and play like OPEF 24-7 at (laughs) max volume or... You could watch this Animorph series. And they're like, you know what? I think I can hold up to the Opeth more than I can want. I can hold up to this to the point where, like, eventually there would be no more crime because um, that threat is too big. <laughs> yeah. If you do a crime, you get sent to Guantanamo. That's one thing that we didn't preface at the beginning. That's what Guantanamo oh, is. It's did you just, not know that, Tessa? It's the crime jail for the whole world. <laughs> Uh, that is why they call it Crime Jail Prime. So, I mean, if yes. you don't know what words mean, waterboarding at Guantanamo Bay sounds like a vacation. So, yes, we can all read drill tweets, <laughs> Tessa. <laughs> Anyways, Braden, I can see in the notes as a very like uh, legal answer. Uh, it is not. I would not describe it as legal. Um, I would describe it as. Uh, I would describe it as very. Philosoph- philosophical, 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 philosophical. Uh, um, I'd be sorry if you did one. describe it. That way. <laughs> As an anarchist, I uh, I reject the premise of the question. Uh, no form <laughs> of detainment by a quote unquote state is legitimate, and any action they take against your body or mind is no less a violation than any other. Uh, please see autonomy, solidarity possibility the colin ward reader for more information that sounded legal <laughs> anyways okay uh, fair it uh, sounded le- but it wasn't le- okay i feel i feel like as an anarchist i should reject that description <laughs> i mean against my you religious whatever you want views. bro this is a free country i i think it should it, be or banned. is it anarchists you decide. <laughs> I think it should be banned, but the U.S. government should stay out of it because this is a global thing. The U.N. needs to get involved. There needs to be sanctions like the Geneva Convention, so you can't use three-sided knives anymore. You just can't watch the animal show anymore. Wait, you can't use three-sided knives? <laughs> Triangle knives. You can't use them. Oh, nuts. <laughs> I'll be right back. <laughs> oh, we've got to cancel that Amazon order. Um, <laughs> next question comes from, or is actually a quiz question. Sorry, what was Nadia Lee Nascimento, uh, w- who plays Cassie? What was her worst memory of working with animals on the set? According to was she her interview? she Russian? I don't know. Uh, Probably sounds like a Russian name. She's not an actor anymore. She went to go work for software companies. So I, I, there is the Wikipedia and IMDb are pretty limited for her. So I don't really know much about it. Um, I mean, she probably said that the animals were smelly and that was rough. OK. <laughs> there was there was one point where she had a monkey on her shoulder. I think that monkey took a giant shit. Down <laughs> <her back. laughs> it totally uh-huh. did. Right yeah. Nice. She seemed like sometimes like uh, the least dedicated of the actors. So I think she just didn't like working with on the set and not with the animals 
Fair enough. I think, or I don't think, her answer was, uh, the worst animal I had to work with was the cockroach. They had to turn off all the sound on the cameras, like on the final recording, they couldn't use the sound because she was screaming. She's specifically talking (laughs) about the part where Cassie morphs the cockroach and has to hold it in her hand. Do you remember that early? Oh, yeah. yeah. Early, early, early. She was the only one that they showed actually holding the cockroach. There's a long story to this, too, which is like, I thought it was hilarious that they couldn't use the sound. Not that they had to, (laughs) because it was close up of the hand, but they lost the cockroach. She dropped it. Oh, my God. the whole crew, including the actors, had to track it down because apparently cockroaches multiply so easily and so quickly that it could, like, really fuck up a TV production studio. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> oh my- Why didn't they just make a different actor hold it? Why did it have to be Cassie? The one Maybe actor who's going to Just scream. get, like, a stand-in hand. Yeah. <laughs> get a hand actor. Get, yeah. like, an identical yeah. hand twin. Get Come on. Hand. Oh, my God. <laughs> Jesus. So that kind of wraps it up for fan questions. There were lots of fan questions that we did not answer. So thank you, everyone, who did submit questions that was very helpful there were some very specific genre of questions that we didn't answer and it was questions that had to do with comparing the tv show to the books which uh potentially in the future uh jared can't answer those questions so uh the three of us might actually answer those not in like a formal episode but in like a bonus episode that we kind of record separately uh because i'm like super super busy i have like a lot of jobs and stuff and like (laughs) We're we're just over here reading fast and being adults. Like we, we <laughs> yeah. have a gimme every once in a while. But I think the questions actually are interesting. So I think we should answer them, just not in this format. So keep an eye out for not bonus when you've episodes. got me the square here who hasn't read the and, books. And such a square. Uh, you can also find links to all these questions and the posts that we made asking for them in the show notes for this episode. Uh, since we're finally back to books, uh, fucking finally, finally, finally back to books, uh, let's do some predictions. Predictions! Predictions! So next week we're going to talk about Megamorphs number four, back to before. Is that right, Tessa? Yeah, that's the next one that we're reading, which is my favorite Megamorphs book. It's so good. I'm excited. Brayden, what's your predictions? I mean, it's kind of obvious. Another fucking Sario rip, almost definitely. Um, if I'm going out on a weird leap back to before, uh, I don't know. They've done most of the shit they can do with time travel, except maybe uh, it's like that one episode of the TV show where Jake gets a redo from the Elemist and they do like a, it's a wonderful life thing. So maybe something like that. Okay. Yeah. Those are good predictions. Or is that Miracle on 34th Street that I'm thinking of? Jared. Oh, no, Jared. You're, where can we find you on the web first? You're, you're slowly disappearing in the dust. <laughs> I don't know. I can't help but feeling like this is the end, guys. But you can find me on uh, uh, CollectiveLegacy.org uh, under the Two Nerds in a Basement heading. Also on uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, any of that stuff. Two Nerds in a Basement across the board. You can find more of our stuff on our podcast page at CollectiveLegacy.org or on Twitter, Tumblr, Instagram, or Facebook. Remember to subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts or else we'll pay you to watch Animorphs for minimum wage. <laughs> you can show your support for our show at our Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash D-O-R-K-B-A-J-I-R. And yes, I did use money from our Patreon to buy the TV show. So full circle, baby. Wait, shit, we can get reimbursed for that? <laughs> Not for me. (laughs) (laughs) We offer special bonuses for patrons like access to our Discord server, Animorphs essays written by us, and much more. We like to give a shout out to our patrons at the hork level or higher by giving them an Animorphs style title. Starting with... Big shout out to Martha Urquhart, colon, the key grip on this show. Shanna, colon, the first AD. And Marie Ellis colon the best boy greg de la posta colon axe's leather jacket like the prop master for apps axe because we're all do we're doing tv set roles here sure yeah <laughs> the guy that, who, the, 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 whoever yeah. decided to put axe in that leather jacket the thing is is that axe's leather jacket is not put in wardrobe with the rest of the clothes no a guy just wears it until the next time axe wears it and that's why it looks so good is because it's lived in damn okay uh steam driven 
colon the boom guy. Andrew Vila colon the cockroach wrangler. Elemist colon the second best boy. Spencer colon the set designer who designed the foot and a half treacherous drop. <laughs> Zachary Vado colon Eugene Lipinski's head polisher. Mariah Wamby colon the makeup artist for Brooke Nevin for the dance episode. Michael Armenta colon the 45th best boy. Okay. <laughs> the long hierarchy of this <laughs> <laughs> Nick colon whoever decided to give the principal a bolo tie the creepiest tie <laughs> Anyanka colon the martini shot and wrap it up that's a wrap <laughs> print it wrap on Mikhail for the filmomorphs my name is Mikhail the voyeur I'm Tessa the director of photography and I'm Brayden, the script supervisor no one pays attention to. <laughs> it's true. And I'm Jared, the auteur filmmaker of us all. Mm-hmm. Oh. And this has been Filmomorphs, the dark... Cinemaphile Chronicles. <laughs> oh no, Jared, what's happening? You're glowing with the light! He's getting are sucked into the sorry There's nothing there! It's the There's only fire! Back. <laughs> Oh no, it's deleting all of our TV show episodes. <laughs> it's erasing it. It's like he never existed. Finally, our plot to get rid of Tessa's like life partner has fucking <laughs> come to fruition. It's been a long road, y'all. You guys found the old tome and learned my story. <laughs> The only way to make him die forever <laughs> is to start an Animorphs podcast in 2016. Eventually, eventually watch all the TV shows. And by the time he's finished, Braden, I call the couch, the TV, and the knives. Uh, Mikhail, I call the other couch, the other TV, and the other knives. I call Tessa's dowry, which uh, her parents have been saying. <laughs> It's Is there a, a dowry? It's a $5 bill! Hi, hello, welcome to the ad for the show. I'm Mitch, the host of Wack Talk Radio. On this show, I talk to interesting people about interesting things. Do you need to know more than that? Okay, fine. Pretty much, we'll talk about whatever my guest is interested in or passionate for. Sometimes it'll be silly, sometimes serious, sometimes a bit of both. Whatever the topic is, hopefully we'll find a way to make you that much more of an expert about it. You can find us at CollectiveLegacy.org, along with some other equally awesome shows on our network. New episodes of Whack Talk Radio are every Sunday and Thursday, wherever you find your podcasts. Let us know what you think on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Wank Talk Radio. That's W E N G H Talk Radio. Wank Talk Radio. Brought to you by Collective Legacy, a podcast network.